Being a single mother is one of the hardest jobs in the world. So many of us know at least one single mother who does everything she can to provide for her children. She would give them the shirt off of her back if it meant that they would be happy. Many of us come from single mothers who gave up everything to raise us. From the outside, that is exactly how friends and family members saw Sarah Barris. Having six children to care for on your own is no joke. With an absent father who never even bothered to meet any of his six children, life is a struggle. But Sarah's family was not all that it seemed. But behind closed doors, this was a home full of dark, disturbing secrets that built up for almost a decade before leading to the end of many young lives. But before we get into the case, I want to say a huge thank you to Private Internet Access for partnering with me on today's video. When you browse the internet with an unprotected device such as your phone, computer, or tablet, you are transmitting a great amount of information out to the open web which can be seen by all sorts of entities before even reaching the website that you wanted to go to. Then when you connect to any public Wi-Fi network like at airports or coffee shops or even friends' houses, your data such as passwords, keystrokes, and even photos are at risk of being stolen by hackers. But private internet access's VPN services hide your IP address and safeguards your internet connection through an encrypted tunnel. This way, your digital data is shielded from hackers who are just looking to exploit your private data. But even beyond the ability to browse privately and protect your data, VPNs also allow you to access services across the internet that may only be accessible based on your physical location. So for example, a few months ago, I was in London and I really wanted to watch The Blacklist on Netflix, which was only available in the US. But I connected to Private Internet Access's VPN to make it seem like I was back home and lo and behold, I was able to watch my show. With Private Internet Access's VPN, you can change your IP address to 84 different countries and all 50 states within the US. This is also so helpful when I'm researching different cases, especially the one that I'm talking about today, which takes place in the UK, so I can just set my location to the UK and gain access to so many more articles than I could in the US. I like private internet access specifically because first of all, you only need one subscription to protect all of your family's devices. It is available for all platforms such as Mac OS, Android iOS. Private internet access is known as the world's most transparent VPN provider with over 30 million downloads. They never record or store user data and their no logs policy has been proven multiple times in court and by a third party audit so you know you can trust them. So if you want to protect all of your and your family's devices, try private internet access out for yourself. They are offering my audience 83% off when you get a two-year subscription, plus you get an extra four months free. That comes out to literally $2.03 per month. All you have to do is sign up using my link down below. Once again, make sure you follow the link in the description box below to get 83% off of your two-year subscription plus an extra four months for free. That is such a steal when it comes to protecting your data. Thank you again so much to Private Internet Access for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into the case. This is the story of Tristan and Blake Barras. Tristan and Blake Barras were the oldest of six children born to their mother, 35-year-old Sarah Barras. The family lived in a home located on Greg House Road in Sure Green, Yorkshire, England. 14-year-old Blake was described as sweet and kind. He wore his heart on his sleeve and made everyone around him feel loved. He had this natural ability to make those around him smile, even if he was having a bad day himself. He cared about everyone around him, and he was known to just have the biggest heart. His little brother, 13-year-old Tristan, was described as being mischievous and lovable. He always wanted to stand out and be different. He dyed his hair multicolored to stand out from the rest, and people loved him for it. He was known to be brave and self-assured. He always did what he wanted, no matter what anybody thought of him. You just look 
like every other person. Why have you got a bright yellow Mexican is a question I've never had to ask in all my years here, but today it's the one I'm asking of you. It turns out Tristan's new look is for charity. My friend is dying of bone cancer. Mm -hmm. I asked if I could dye my hair yellow for him. But what kind of Friday is it today? Friday! I need to make sure that the neighbours across the road complain is too noisy. Exactly. To those on the outside, it appeared that Sarah was the single mother to six children ages 7 months, 3 years old, 10, 11, 13, and 14 years old. She was seen as a loving, devoted mother who was doing everything in her power to raise her children. She was known to be her children's biggest advocate and did everything to help them and support them. That was made clear when, in November of 2018, Sarah reached out to their local child and family services agency to ask for help with her second oldest child, Tristan. It was reported that Tristan had been diagnosed with autism, and I believe both him and Blake, as well as a few other children in the family, were also diagnosed with ADHD. Either way, when Sarah reached out for help, she stated that both of the oldest boys had an unhealthy obsession with pornography. She stated that 13-year-old Tristan specifically was showing a lot of behavioral issues, constantly accessing internet porn, and there was even a time where he stole an aunt's car without permission. He was also starting to show some aggression towards his younger siblings. Sarah was getting to her wit's end with Tristan's behaviors, and she just didn't know what to do. So a social worker was assigned to her case and went into the home to do an investigation into Tristan and his overall home life. In that situation, the social worker found that Sarah truly was doing her best to support her kids. Sarah played an active role with social services, attending all of the meetings and advocating for her children's needs. So it didn't seem like there was any sort of underlying issues going on in the home. It didn't seem like Sarah was causing him to act out and it didn't seem like the way he was being raised was to blame for how he was acting. Now, the social worker didn't know who the father of her children was, but Sarah did have a brother living nearby 39-year-old Brandon Machin, who was always there to help with whatever the children needed. He even spent most days in the home with Sarah and the children to help out. So, even though the social worker noted that there was no male influence in the home full-time and Sarah wasn't very forthcoming with who the father of her children was, she was doing her best. Over the course of several interactions, Sarah did eventually develop a good working relationship with the social worker. The worker felt that Sarah was doing her best and assured Sarah that social services recognized how hard she was trying. However, it didn't appear that, at least at first, the social worker did that much to actually help Sarah take care of the problems that she was dealing with. When the social worker did reach out to other agencies for Sarah to access additional resources, there were significant delays which limited the family's access to those resources. They also initially referred the Barras family to the multi-agency support team referred to as MAST. This is an integrated team made up of different disciplines which works together to use psychological and therapeutic methods to support parents and families. These teams are made up of counselors, therapists, teachers, and mentors. They work on improving behavior in the home and at school and manage disabilities in children such as ADHD and autism and then help children after serious events like parental divorce or death and things like that. So they're basically an all-encompassing team to help children deal with the things that they may not be dealing with in the most healthy ways. However, because of how well Sarah was working Working with social services, they closed the referral feeling that this was no longer necessary. Overall, the social worker did appreciate what Sarah was doing for her children, but didn't necessarily do what was needed to help Sarah resolve the issues that she reached out to social services to fix to begin with. And as time went on, it seemed that Sarah was getting more and more worried about her children and their behaviors. By early in the year in 2019, it seemed that now both Tristan and Blake had been accused by Sarah of sexually inappropriate behavior towards a younger sibling. 
it seemed that Tristan and Blake's behaviors were getting worse and worse, and Sarah didn't know what to do. By May 21st, 2019, a social worker told Sarah that they were going to hold a strategy meeting concerning the family, but she was not allowed to attend. That really scared Sarah. She felt that the lack of action at first was a sign that social services really wanted to help her and the family and wasn't going to be taking the children away from her. But after being informed of this meeting, she started to worry that more serious action was going to take place and she worried that the children may be taken away. At the time, Tristan, who the original social services report was made for, was considered the status of a child in need. According to the Children Act of 1989, a child in need is defined as a child who is unlikely to achieve or maintain a reasonable level of health or development, or whose health and development is likely to be significantly or further impaired without provision of services, or a child who is disabled. Under this status, the child is considered for special education services, therapeutic intervention, and basically help with day-to-day -day life if needed. However, after the meeting on May 22nd, 2019, Tristan was moved to the status of child in protection. This means that the child is in a situation where they are likely to be harmed or has suffered significant harm and needs to be closely monitored or even removed from the home to prevent further harm. The reason that Tristan was moved to this status was because a few days prior, Sarah had been questioned extensively about the paternity of her children. The more they questioned her about who the father was, the more defiant and uncooperative she became. This was concerning to child services because they needed to know who the father was to establish whether it was possible that the children had been exposed to sexual behavior or abuse which makes absolute sense. Because in many situations, when young children and teenagers are exhibiting overly sexual behavior, inappropriate behavior, many times it can be because they suffered from sexual abuse themselves. But that's not how Sarah saw the situation. She refused to tell police who the father of her children were, and even the change in status did not convince her. However, Everything came to a head by the morning of May 24th, 2019. By 7.45 a.m. that morning, South Yorkshire police received a call from someone reporting that they were concerned for the safety of the children who lived in the Barras home. Shortly after, 15 police cars arrived to the home on Greg House Road. When police entered the house, they found that all six children who lived there were lying unconscious. Tristan and Blake were each found in their beds with plastic bags over their heads. Also in the home, they found 35-year-old Sarah and her brother, 39-year-old Brandon, who were promptly arrested while police and the forensic team investigated the scene. At the time, all six children were transferred to the Sheffield Children's Hospital for treatment, and unfortunately, shortly after arriving to the hospital, both Tristan and Blake passed away. Meanwhile, the other four children remained in the hospital for several hours for treatment, but they survived. I will discuss exactly what happened to them in just a minute. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're here on Greg House Road here in Sheffield. Uh, a tragic scene of events. Uh, this morning at around 7.30, the emergency services responded to a property on this street. Um, as a result of, of that, uh, Yorkshire Air Ambulance Service, the Yorkshire Air Ambulance Service, uh, attended here and a number of children were taken to hospital. Uh, sadly, two children have since died and four children remain in hospital. As you can appreciate, this is a very early stages of our investigation. Our detectives are supporting the family. Uh, the family are aware of the circumstances and our inquiries will continue to develop during the day. I think it's really important that I reassure, reassure the wider community that there is no wider risk. Two people have been arrested on suspicion of murder and remain in police custody. Can you tell me what you think caused those children's injuries? I think at this moment in time it's too early to say. A post-mortem will take place. The investigation is at very early stages and detectives are working closely uh, with uh, a number of different uh, lines of inquiry. 
um, our specialist family support officers are with the family at this moment in time. Have your officers had to use any protective equipment or clothing to go into the house? As part of our forensic examination, that will be routine. But in, in terms of that wider bit, no, not at this moment in time. Do you believe you a weapon was used? Uh, at this moment in time, I'm not able to provide those further details. As you can appreciate, this is a very much a live investigation. Um, and it's important that I reassure the community and also that speculation. I'm aware of wider speculation regarding the use of weapons. At the moment, uh, there is no wider risk to the community in Sheffield. Now, of course, after the initial raid of the home and the arrests that resulted, police needed to continue their investigation to figure out what was going on here. I want to note now that, of course, after the children regained consciousness and were able to speak again, they were questioned. One of the children told the police officer that his father was not around. He told him that his father had died in the Second World War. Obviously, this made no sense because all of the children were ages 14 and under, so there was no possible way that their father could have died sometime in the 1940s. So still, the identity of their father was a complete mystery. Next, police were able to look into Sarah's cell phone records and social media messages that she had sent out just days before the deaths and in the hours surrounding the deaths. And these uncovered some very dark, disturbing things. Sometime in May, as social services were getting more serious about the allegations being made within the home, Sarah messaged one friend, which showed her frustration with her children, as well as a strong desire to find a solution to her problems. She wrote, quote, I still feel like I failed Blake, so this isn't helping. I feel like I should lock me and my law away so they can't hurt anyone else. I want to die daily, run away, and hide from everyone. In another message, she wrote to the friend, quote, I've thought of every possible solution to this mess. Mass murder, putting them all in care, checking into the local nut house. I love my kids too much to kill them. I can't put them into care for the same reasons. Then by May 23rd, the day before the children were all found unconscious, Sarah received a phone call. This was a call from an individual who informed her that Tristan had allegedly carried out another sexual assault against another child. This person told Sarah that she intended to report the incident to police that following day. According to police, it was either on the 22nd or 23rd that Sarah and her half-brother, Brandon, hatched this plan to murder her children. Either they thought of it on the 22nd after the meeting with that social worker where she was afraid of her children being taken away, or on the 23rd after becoming enraged after finding out about Tristan's alleged behavior. Either way, on the night of the 23rd after receiving this call, Sarah and Brandon carried out their plan to murder their children. That night, the two gathered a bunch of ADHD medication that had been prescribed to four of the six children. So they had access to quite a bit of this medication. That night, Sarah and Brandon forced all of the children to take copious amounts of the medication, hoping that it would kill them overnight. That night, after taking all of that medication, one of the brothers messaged a friend on Nintendo Switch to say that they were feeling sick. Sarah also reportedly told friends and neighbors that the kids were suffering from some sort of stomach bug and weren't feeling well. But when all of the children woke up on the morning of the 24th, Sarah and Brandon realized that the medication did not kill them. So they went online and started researching other methods to kill their children. They decided to strangle Tristan and Blake to death. Sarah started with Tristan strangling him with her bare hands. He fought with everything he had fighting against her and yelling at her to stop. Blake actually witnessed this yelling at her to stop killing Tristan. But that is when Brandon stepped in and strangled Blake also with his bare hands. Then they placed plastic bags over their heads to make sure that they died and then placed them in their beds. After that, they took their next oldest child, who was 11, and attempted to kill him by drowning him in the bathtub. That child also struggled violently and fought with everything they had. As they were being drowned, the child yelled out, why are you trying to kill us? But thankfully, this child did survive 
it was reported that two of the other children also witnessed these attacks. After carrying out this heinous plot to murder their children, Sarah then devised a plan of her own to place the blame on Brandon for the murders. But before I explain that part of the case, I want to pause for a minute and go back just a bit. I am not exactly sure when, but sometime after being arrested, both Sarah and Brandon admitted to what they did, and both of them described in detail how they drugged the children, strangled the oldest two, and tried drowning the third oldest. It was also at this time that Sarah finally admitted to police who the father of her children really was. It was someone that was involved in their lives and someone that nobody would have suspected. It was her own half-brother, Brandon Machen, who lived just down the street from them. Like I said, he provided a lot of financial support for the family. He was at their home every single day. He would spend most days at the home with the children, then return back to his own home at night. Despite this though, the children never actually knew who their father was. They were told their entire lives that their father died when they were young, which makes no sense, again, because one of them thought that he died in the Second World War, and they also had a seven-month-old sibling, so it would make no sense that for 14 years the dad was dead, but then somehow he was also still procreating these other children. None of this made any sense, but I guess the children didn't really question it because why would you question what your mother is telling you? You're not going to think that she's lying to you about your father being dead. But either way, obviously, this is very, very disturbing. As most people probably know, this can cause significant disabilities in children conceived out of incest. Again, as I stated earlier, Tristan was diagnosed with autism, and I believe four of their other children were diagnosed with ADHD. They had six children total, and one of them was only seven months old, so too young to be diagnosed with autism or ADHD, so it's possible that every single one of their children had some sort of disability. Now, I feel like I don't have to say this, but I will, just for those of you who want to question what I'm saying. Obviously, disabilities happen in a multitude of different ways. Having a disability does not make someone any less deserving of life than someone without a disability. People with disabilities still contribute so much to society, and nobody should be treated differently because of their diagnosis. I work with children who have disabilities, and let me tell you, the kids I work with are my entire world. It is pretty much my life's work to help children who have disabilities, so again, I'm not saying that disabilities are a negative thing, but even beyond autism and ADHD, there are a plethora of very severe disabilities that can happen out of incest, and that is why it is illegal. There is a huge difference between happening to be born with a disability and your parents causing your disability. There's a difference between having cerebral palsy because you came out of the birth canal a little bit funky and you had a lack of oxygen to your brain and you just happened to be like that and cerebral palsy that's caused by abuse from a parent. There is a difference between having a cognitive disability because that's how you were born and you having a cognitive disability because your parents gave you shaken baby syndrome when you were a baby. Those are two very, very different things. But having a disability does make life a lot harder. Having a disability can result in being completely dependent on your caregiver, which obviously does make life more difficult. But either way, this was a huge reason, probably the reason why Sarah was so afraid of social services and so convinced that they were going to take her children away. She knew that incest is wrong and illegal and immoral, so she felt that if she told anybody about the paternity of her children, that they would be taken away from her, and they probably would have been. So now, going back to the days around the murders. Like I said, after attempting to kill all six children and strangling the life out of their oldest two, Sarah carried out her own plan of trying to place the blame on Brandon. On the morning of the 24th at 7.08 a.m., just minutes after Tristan and Blake's death, Sarah made a series of notes on her phone. They are as follows. The first one reads, 
Brandon is the dad to all the kids. The pills didn't work, so he's had me kill Tristan and he's killed Blake and a third child. I'm sat here with the other three. The next note read, he's going to kill them, then me. She continued, he's tried to drown a third child. It's not working. I'm so scared. Her final note, which was written at 7.16 a.m., reads, quote, if by some miracle my kids live, please look after them and make sure they know I love them, XX, please. Less than 10 minutes after making these quotes, Sarah texted a friend. She wrote, quote, he's trying to kill us and Tristan and Blake are already dead. After receiving that text message, the friend called the police and asked them to check in on the family home. And after that, again, as we know, police arrived shortly after by 7.45 a.m. And again, at that time, all six children were unconscious and two of them had been strangled to death. Immediately after being arrested and taken into custody, Sarah handed a police officer a notebook which had different funeral arrangements that she made for the children. In that notebook, there were also messages to friends and Brandon stating that she had no choice but to do what she did because she could not bear to be separated from her children. But after both were separated and placed into different interrogation rooms, Sarah initially started by placing all of the blame solely on Brandon. She stated that her brother killed her children. She said that he fed her kids sleeping pills after they couldn't sleep and that he killed them after they woke up the following morning. Brandon also started off his questioning by saying that he was solely responsible, that Sarah had no part in this. He was even willing to sign a confession stating this. But after some time, Sarah and Brandon started to tell the police what really happened. Sarah said that the social worker got too close to finding out that Brandon was the father to all of her children. Brandon said the same, saying that they tried to get more of the ADHD tablets on the 22nd to make sure that they had enough to kill the children. This was confirmed by the doctor's office, who said that Sarah tried repeatedly that day to get refills of her kids' ADHD meds, but she was denied because the requests were placed too early. If it's anything like meds here, you can only get them monthly. They are a stimulant and a controlled substance, so they are very strict on when and how much you can get. During Sarah's confession, she said that she would rather see her children dead than in social services care. It was stated that she and her brother had very rough childhoods themselves, probably children of the system, so she didn't want the same fate for her own own children. She added that she gave them life so she could take it away. In Brandon's confession, he said that his reaction was after getting the news of Tristan's alleged sexual assault. He said that after getting that phone call, his, quote, instant reaction made him want to, quote, rip the heads off of Blake and Tristan. He continued saying, how do you describe that feeling you want to get a hold of them and strangle the life of them? Again, it was after that that they forced the kids to take all of those stimulants, hoping that it would kill them. So after all of this, obviously, police knew exactly what happened here. Both of them ended up confessing, so there wasn't really any questions about what happened. Because of that, both Brandon and Sarah ultimately decided to plead guilty to all charges that they faced, including two counts of murder for Tristan and Blake, conspiracy to murder their six children, and attempted murder for Blake, Tristan, and the other child that we discussed earlier. For this, each of them was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after a minimum of 35 years served. After the sentencing, a family friend spoke about the children and the whole tragic case. Blake and Tristan were two beautiful, confident, and outgoing boys who both had a bright future ahead of them. They had so many friends, and they lit up any room they were in, especially Tristan, who loved to dye his hair bright colours. Daily life will never be the same again now. The boys have left behind younger siblings whose lives have been turned upside down. They adored their older brothers and they looked up to them. The boys have also left behind close family friends and younger children who looked up to them and who saw them on a regular basis. And this tragedy hasn't just affected those close to them, but the whole community too. A piece of all our hearts died on the 24th of May 2019. 
which we will never get back. Blake and Tristan leave a huge empty void in our lives and we did not get the chance to say goodbye. We are relieved justice has been served, but it should never have come to this. We cannot put into words the pain and emptiness we feel, but we find some comfort in knowing Blake and Tristan will always be remembered and how loved both boys were. Thank you. My name is Edmund Talbot and I work for the Crown Prosecution Service. This was an appalling crime in which two young lives were lost and a family was torn apart, leaving a community in shock. Two of the surviving children witnessed their older children, older siblings being attacked and the trauma that all the children have experienced and will continue to experience is unimaginable. This is now paramount that the surviving children are allowed to rebuild their lives in peace. Of course, in the aftermath of all of this, the surviving children are just broken. One of the older children, I don't know if it was the one they tried drowning or not, but they said that they were afraid of becoming a murderer themselves. One of the prosecutors in this case said at the sentencing hearing, quote, When the older two children were told Sarah and Brandon had pleaded guilty to the murders of their brothers and the attempted murders of them, one of them said that they were worried that they would become a murderer when they were older because that's what their mom and Brandon did. They said they didn't want to be like that. She continued, quote, both of the older children are emotionally broken and don't know why this happened. They repeatedly asked why and how. We don't have the answers. Both keep saying that they just want a nice family home and say that they want their brothers back because it's too hard without them. They said that the younger children really struggle every day with the fact that they will never see their older brothers ever again. Of course, they will need therapy and a lot of support to get them through everything that they went through. The most recent article I could find was actually from a few years ago. It mentioned that the kids were being cared for by family and social services, but that could have changed by now. Hopefully, they are with family members who stepped up to care for them. But honestly, I'm not sure. I truly am just hoping for the best for those kids. As for the motives in this case, at her sentencing hearing, it was argued by Sarah's defense that she was so desperate to keep her kids out of social services care that she felt that she had no option but to kill them. But some people don't actually buy that. Other criminologists who have looked into the case believe that Sarah may be a lot more sinister than we initially imagined. Growing up, both Sarah and Brandon were known to kill pet mice for fun, and they were very fascinated by vampires, blood, and gore. As many of us know, a huge red flag for future serial killer behavior is starting by killing animals. Sarah was also known to post dark quotes on Facebook, one post stating, quote, Murder is just like potato chips, you can't stop with just one. That is a quote from a Stephen King novel. She also once posted an image of a Grim Reaper with the caption, coming for you. Obviously, these posts do not indicate that Sarah was planning to murder her children. A lot of people make dark jokes and say things like this and make, you know, weird Facebook posts and never go on to do anything. A lot of people are into gore and vampires and just violent movies and things like that and don't actually behave that way in their real lives, but when we do see those things in hindsight after someone commits a crime like this, that can be significant. One criminologist wrote that they believe that Sarah is a narcissist who could have been planning this for a long time. They said that it's possible that both Tristan and Blake were getting to the age where they would start asking more and more questions. They would probably want to know who their father was, as would any child of a single parent. They were getting close to the age where they could expose the secret if they found out. So, one criminologist thinks that Sarah killed them out of control, so she could control the narrative and what people found out about them. She wanted to keep up with this image that she was trying to portray of a nice, normal family. And when her family was at risk of being exposed, as any narcissist would, she thought of herself first, thinking, poor me. I can't cope. And because of this, she made the calculated decision to engage in the violent behavior that ended the lives of her children. 
She was not suffering from psychosis or a mental illness that clouded her judgment. She is pure evil and would do anything to cover her disgusting, dark secret. We can see that she sent out those frantic text messages and just started creating those notes in her phone in the hours around the murders. According to what I could find online before the murders, there was never any indication that Sarah was struggling with the boy's behavior. All of this could be a way to cover up her true motives for the murders. That is just the opinion of one criminologist who looked into this case, but I definitely thought that it was interesting. I do agree to some degree. She is the one who made the choice to get sexually involved with her own brother, and she knew that it was wrong. She chose not to just have one child with him, but to have six children, all of whom she knew she had to hide from social services. Why? Because she knew that incest is wrong. The choices that she made were wrong, yet she continued to do it. It is her actions and Brandon's actions that led to this whole situation. It's not social services fault. It's not the behaviors of her children. It is her and Brandon's fault. So when it comes to the idea of control, I do agree that that is probably the main motivator in this crime. I think that it wasn't just the control of people finding out about what happened, but I also think it was control of her children. She didn't want social services to be able to raise her children because she wanted to control what happened to them, which makes some sense. As a mother, you do want to control what happens to your children. You don't want to see them being taken away, but I don't think that Sarah did that because she cared for her children so much. I think it truly is because she cared about herself and what other people felt about her and her children. Another one of Sarah's siblings also came out and said that she believes that Sarah and Brandon were evil since birth. She said, quote, those two have been evil since birth. They are both as bad as each other. They are both murdering evil psychopaths. Continuing to say, quote, I witnessed Brandon's violence towards Blake years ago, and I knew that something wasn't right. I visited them when Tristan was still in his pushchair, and Blake was only a toddler. He must have been three or four. We were out walking when Brandon grabbed Blake's arm really roughly and dragged him across the floor. It was enough to know that something wasn't right, so I called social services and asked them to look into that. If they had, the boys might still be here today. Which is very sad that the sibling did attempt to get social services involved and they didn't get involved at that point. Something could have been done a lot earlier to figure out the situation and maybe even prevent them from having more children. Not that those other four children didn't deserve to be born, but again, children born out of incest, it's just such a higher possibility that they are going to have a lot of problems with their lives. As for the allegations of sexual abuse at the hands of Tristan and Blake, obviously, I don't want to speak ill of the dead. I don't want to make them out to be bad kids or deviants. So I want to preface this with saying that I don't know if the allegations are true or not. They could be totally fabricated or they could be real. If these boys truly did do these things, obviously they needed help. But I do think that their home environments and how they were being raised has a lot to do with it. Again, for the sake of not throwing out baseless accusations, I don't know if I think they were sexually abused in the home. But we do know that having sexual relations with family members is not out of the question for Brandon and Sarah, clearly. So it could be possible, allegedly, that they abused their children and may have sexually abused them, which led to the behavior from Tristan and Blake. Because in a lot of cases, not all, but I will say that most cases, children don't exhibit sexually deviant behavior for no reason. Most of the time, the cause can be found in the home or with people close to them. So take that with what you will. I don't, again, know if I believe these allegations, if they are true. I do think that there was more going on behind the scenes than we know about. And I don't know if we will ever find out if those younger children will ever come out with what they know or even if they knew that the older two were being sexually abused if they were. We may never know that part of this case. I do also want to note that after all of this happened, none of the kids asked for Sarah or Brandon. I feel like even in cases where parents do something horrible to siblings, the kids will still request their parents for comfort in times of trauma. 
But after being taken away, none of those kids wanted comfort from their parents. They just wanted their older brothers back. So that says something to me, that they didn't find comfort in their own parents. They found it from their older brothers. What does that say about how the parents raised their kids and if, you know, Tristan and Blake were truly abusing them? You can decide that on your own. After this case all went down, social services did do an internal investigation into the case that they took out with the family. I touched on this a bit before, but they did find a few problems. This included the social worker not initially looking more into the paternity of the children, They found issue with the lack of resources and the amount of time it took to provide the family with those resources. All in all, even though they found Sarah to be a loving, competent mother, they felt that they could have improved in those areas. Hopefully, after they see this case, they will make those changes accordingly, but they did say that after reviewing the case, they didn't find that there was any way that they could have predicted any of this or prevented it from happening. There was no way that they could have thought that Sarah would take this drastic action to cover up what was going on in the home. And again, they didn't even know that Brandon was the father. They didn't even know that Sarah had something like this to hide. So they said that there's no way that they could have prevented any of this. But after that, that is all I know for today's case. I know this was an absolutely wild one, but as soon as I saw it, I knew I needed to cover it. It's a case where you truly don't believe what you are reading. It truly doesn't feel real, but it is, and it's devastating. And my heart absolutely goes out to the children who survived this whole mess, especially the one that they tried drowning. I can't imagine the kind of trauma that this child has to live through. I just hope that all of those children turn out okay and that they make the most out of their lives from here. But that is where I am going to end today's video and now I want to know what you all think. I really want you to sound off in the comments on this one. Do you think that Sarah killed her kids because she truly feared them being taken away or do you think she was just desperate to cover for her own secret? Do you think she's a loving mother who just survived the system and didn't want the same for her children or do you think she's a narcissist? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn those notifications on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.